Our friends at Manscaped are helping you clear your driveway for safe travels this holiday season. From stocking stuffers to gift exchanges, Manscaped's products are at the top of every wish list. Get 20% off and free shipping by going to manscaped.com forward slash skill up. Click the link below or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Gamers, I am back from LA, baby. I was over there last week for the Game Awards and God damn, did I have a good time. I attended the show, had some great seats right near that mini stage they use. I met a bunch of awesome people at the after party like Charlotte McBurney, voice of Amicia. And when I was headed back to my hotel room at 1.30 a.m., I met Christopher Judge. He had just put God of War Ragnarok director Eric Williams into a cab. And I was like, I love you, man. I love you so much. And he was like, okay, good night. No, he was actually much nicer than that. And we got to chatting about his true passion, golf. For real, Kratos himself is mad golfer. Wouldn't have picked it. It seems like more of an Abby thing. I did get the chance to chat with Eric Williams as well because the next morning I actually visited Sony Santa Monica Studios with the Friends Per Second podcast crew. We interviewed Eric where we spoke extensively about how fighting games have influenced his career as a game maker and talked about what was next for him. It was an awesome chat. And if you want to have a listen, I'll leave a link to that below. Don't forget, you can also get that on podcast platforms. So this episode is an important one, sort of, because it's actually the last regular episode of the year. Next week, I'm going to be doing my 2022 wrap up where I'll take a look back at the biggest news stories of the year in order to both ask and answer the question, do I recommend 2022? Find out next week. Today's episode is going to be focused on the Game Awards. I know it's old news, but it's always old news when you tune into this show. So you really shouldn't expect anything different this week. Besides, the Game Awards come at you pretty thick and fast, so it's kind of nice to get a top-line look at the most important stuff so you can start marking your calendars and get ready for what is sure to be a pretty massive 2023. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, here comes the final news block of 2022. So the Game Awards was actually sort of two shows, the pre-show and then the main event. The pre-show kicked off with the reveal of a new Dead Cells crossover titled Return to Castlevania. It was just an animated trailer, but it doesn't take too much imagination to see how well these two franchises line up with each other. No release date on this one yet, but it is highly likely to be sometime in 2023. We knew that Valiant Hearts was getting a sequel and we got our first look at it here. The bad news, it's a mobile game exclusive to Netflix. Not sure why anyone thought either of those things was a good idea for this franchise, but hey, it's Ubisoft and they are hardly known for their bulletproof decision making. Returnal was one of the most leaked PC ports ever and we finally got confirmation of it during the pre-show. It's arriving sometime early in 2023 for Steam, but do watch out as the recommended specs are 32 gigabytes of RAM, which is Insane. I'm not sure what's going on there. That's very odd. Hellboy Web of Weird is a new action roguelike that's fully embracing the comic book art style that feels just right for a comic book franchise. That's hitting 2023. Post Trauma is a neat looking survival horror title complete with the classic fixed camera angles, which are all the rage these days. That too is sometime 2023. After Us is very much my jam, a chill exploratory game with some flow state elements. I'm always down for stuff like this and I'll be carving out some time for it when it drops in 2023. Been a while since we've heard from Replaced. This one famously picked up where The Last Night left off, since that one seems to be stuck in development hell. Borrowing liberally from The Last Night's art style, Replaced is one of the best looking upcoming titles, full stop. The art design here is absolutely superb and hopefully this one actually ships. The recent trailer does list the 2023 release date, but offers no more specifics than that, so fingers crossed. Rounding out the pre-show was the official release date announcement of Street Fighter 6. This one had leaked before the show, courtesy of the PSN, but it was confirmed here June 2nd. The trailer also included the reveal of a number of new characters and further fleshed out the features we can expect in the World Tour mode. Even as a non-fighting games dude, I continue to be impressed by how good this looks, and if Capcom can stick the landing here, you get the impression that Street Fighter 6 is going to be a very big moment in the fighting game scene. At that point, it was time for the show proper to be Begin. Jeff Keighley took to the stage to welcome everyone and to welcome a special presenter, Al Pacino. As soon as he walked out on stage, I was like, why the fuck is Al Pacino here? And sure enough, he kind of felt the same way. Plus, he had some problems with the teleprompter. I may come as a, it may come as a shock to you, but uh, I, 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 I'm, it's hard for me to see the teleprompter. <laughs> He presented the award for Best Performance, a hotly contested category given that it included some real standouts, but the award went to fan favorite Christopher Judge, who, well, let's just say he was in no rush to get off the stage. Thank you uh, for believing in me and um, thank you for having me read for the role. Um, 
uh, everyone at every level, be it designer, be it whatever it was, who worked under extraordinary conditions. There's a, there's a time frame that cinematics have to fit into. Hopefully not speeches. Um, <laughs> His speech went for around nine minutes when it really should have topped out at around 90 seconds. I swear I could almost hear Jeff Keighley off stage yelling, wind it up, Chris. In judge's defense, it was a beautiful speech full of heart and he was single-handedly responsible for giving away nine Steam Decks. So big ups for that. And then all of a sudden, super giant sucker punched us with a reveal that nobody saw coming. Your family awaits you. Wait for me, father. I'll be this. If you'd have asked me what Supergiant's next project would be, I'd have bet big, big money against the Hades sequel, since this is a studio that typically doesn't do sequels. At the same time, Hades was an outsized success, so it does make sense for them to double down in this instance. As for the reveal, I don't know, it looks very Hades at this point. Other than a new cast, nothing jumps out at me as being hugely different from the previous game, but that didn't stop God of War Ragnarok from blowing the doors off the joint. Bottom line, Super Giants a studio we can all trust, and I'm certain they're not gonna half-ass this one since that just isn't their style. We can all expect Hades 2 to hit early access sometime in 2023. Jeff Gilly was very excited about this next reveal, and for good reason. Take a look. This is Judas, and it's from Ghost Story Games, the studio set up by Ken Levine after he left Irrational Games, where he led the creation and development of all three Bioshock titles. There's been a lot of ink spilled guesstimating what his next game would be, and now we know. It's kind of like Bioshock. I mean, obviously, there's a whole new cast of characters and a new setting, yada yada, but the art style, the automatons, the fire in the palm of your hand, there's a lot of Bioshock energy right here. It's looking super interesting, and given the pedigree of the talent behind it, everyone's expecting big things, no release date yet. Bayonetta 4 is apparently coming at some point, but before then, on March 17th to be precise, you can enjoy Bayonetta Origins, Cereza and the Lost Demon, which is an adventure game prequel thing. I don't know about this one, didn't really grab me to be honest. Stray then took home the best debut game award congrats to the team there straight really struck a chord with people for a time being the highest rated game on all of steam for 2022 it's simple in that it's a game about a cat but cats mean a lot to people and no game had ever allowed you to control a cat in quite this way and the world and the soundtrack were really special to boot very much expect a straight two at some point i'm sure the team are already hard at work on that one there was a new destiny 2 lightfall trailer did you see the dude grapple onto the thunder crashing titan oh my god I had to change my pants after that. After that, we got another look at Rocksteady's Suicide Squad due out sometime next year. Take a listen. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. The trailer didn't give away a huge amount, except for one important detail. The late Kevin Conroy, who sadly passed some weeks back, delivered one of his final renditions of the Batman for this game. It will be bittersweet to hear it, but it's nice to know that we get to experience his Batman one last time. Rest in peace, Mr. Conroy. You are sorely missed. Arkane would unsurprisingly go on to snatch up the Best Adaptation Award, but shout out to Cyberpunk Edge Runners, which is absolutely S tier, particularly on the soundtrack front. I still listen to that on the rig. Speaking of adaptations, The Last of Us TV show arrives soon, and so too does Part 1 on PC, confirmed for a March 3rd release. Man, Jedi Survivor, take a look at this. I feel like Jedi Fallen Order gets a bit of a raw deal. I think people focus on its shortcomings and its weird implementation of Souls-like elements, when it was really a pretty damn solid offering and one of the best Star Wars things we've gotten since Disney took the franchise's steering wheel and drove it straight off a cliff. Jedi Survivor though, god damn does this look good. I'm surely biased given that I very much enjoyed the first one, but this looks like a massive step up, especially in the visuals department where it looks absurdly good. This one has long been rumored for a March release and it was confirmed here, March 17th, Q4 
cannot wait for this. Earthblade is the next thing from the creators of Celeste, though unfortunately it won't be dropping until 2024, so don't get too hyped for this one yet. Dune Awakening, or Dune as Americans say it, is that survival MMO from Funcom based on the book and the movie. We got some in-engine cinematics here and the art design looks on point. Can't say any more about the rest of the game though, since we know literally nothing about it, but there you go. I could say something similar about this next one, but that doesn't stop me from being irrationally excited. Norm kind of let the cat out of the bag on this one a while back, but that didn't stop the official reveal of Death Stranding 2 from being pretty damn epic. From the remix of BB Song to the reprise cast to the hints and Easter eggs strewn throughout the trailer, this was classic Kojima all the way, and I'm totally here for it. No release date yet, hopefully it's 2023, but I'm guessing probably not. EA showed off a new magic-inspired first-person shooter titled Immortals of Avium. Only a CG trailer for now, so nothing else on that except it's a 2023 release as well. Time for another actual award. I know, very odd, but they do have a few of them to hand out during Jeff Keighley's trailerama. This one was for best narrative, and to absolutely no one's surprise, God of War Ragnarok took this one home. Totally deserved since it was the narrative that was the beating heart of this entire experience, and one that I thought was even better than the gut punch that was 2018's script. We knew we'd be seeing some Tekken 8 at the Game Awards, and sure enough, we did take a look. If this drops the same year as Street Fighter 6 and potentially whatever's coming next from NetherRealm Studios, then 2023 is going to be a red letter year for fighting game fans. Nightingale is one I'd recommend putting on your radar. This is from a team of Bioware veterans led by a former Bioware Studio boss. They're making a survival game that looks to infuse narrative elements into a genre that's really struggled to integrate them. That one should hit early access sometime in 2023. Wayfinder is a new action RPG from Airship Syndicate, a studio led by Joe Maggiera, creator of both Darksiders and Battle Chasers. So look, his studio has done Battle Chasers, Darksiders Genesis, and Ruin King, a League of Legends story. All very good games, very well received. They are three for three at this point, and this is their next thing. This trailer didn't look amazing, but I'm at a point where I think it'd be foolish to bet against this studio. So I'm interested to see where this one goes. It's in closed testing right now, which means we should expect more testing to commence sometime in 2023. Incidentally, this is being published by Digital Extremes, makers of Warframe. So that's kind of cool. Halsey is apparently a big deal. I don't know. I don't listen to popular music, but she channeled her inner Lilith to help hype up the release date of Diablo 4, now locked in for June 6th. So this was kind of awkward timing because that very day, a report dropped from the Washington Post alleging a whole bunch of very worrying stuff about the development of Diablo 4. Apparently, the project has been mired in mismanagement with various parts of the game thrown out owing to a lack of clear creative direction. Staff attrition is a big problem with numerous leads and experienced hands leaving the team over the course of development with Bobby Kotick himself greenlighting additional stock incentives to stop staff from leaving. That June 6 date is concerning a number of staff as they've said there's no way they can hit that date without crunching or without major parts of the game being removed or delayed to a post-launch window. Also, and perhaps most alarmingly, the script for Diablo 4 has undergone major revisions with at least one version including a through line based on sexual assault. And I mean the hard R variety, the version I can't say without YouTube demonetizing my video. Numerous Blizzard staff pushed back on this as they said that Diablo was not the right franchise to handle such a sensitive topic, and yeah, it probably isn't. Blizzard themselves acknowledged that this plotline was a feature of previous versions of the script, but has since been removed due to internal feedback. The addition of Vicarious Visions seems to have done very little to ease the burden on other staff, as apparently there's been issues aligning everyone around a shared goal that doesn't appear to fully exist yet. Numerous staff are expecting a very rocky review window, with some predicting mediocre but passable scores. Not exactly what you want to see from a flagship franchise. From the looks of things, that June 6 date is more aspirational than anything else, and I'd bet some big dollars we'll see that slip into the latter part of the year. Back to the Game Awards. Horizon Forbidden West is getting a DLC on April 9th. 19th, titled The Burning Shore. It's set in Hollywood and it's exclusive to the PS5. Ripperino, PS4 bros. Bayonetta 3 would go on to win Best Action Game Award with Doug Bowser accepting it on behalf of Platinum because I guess Kami is not really down for the whole award show thing. 
Amazon aren't done with the world of video games, it seems. After a disappointing opening salvo with a whole bunch of cancelled and underperforming titles, they're taking another swing in the form of Blue Protocol, a Bandai Namco developed game that Amazon will be publishing in the West. It's free to play and it has a lot of Genshin Impact energy. This one's dropping sometime in 2023. Remnant 2 exists. God damn, man. I don't think I yelled with excitement at any point during this show, but boy did I holler when I saw this logo flash up on screen. Remnant from the Ashes from Gunfire Games was an absolutely superb third-person shooter, roguelike, souls-like, that came out of nowhere, and good as it was, you could just tell that this franchise had more promise than that first game was able to realize. The sequel was confirmed here, again developed by Gunfire and published by Gearbox. No date yet, but I cannot wait. Best score would go to Bear McCreary for his work on God of War Ragnarok. Not gonna lie, Xenoblade 3 may be a little overlooked on this one, but congrats to Bear McCreary nonetheless. Hey, check out this new Space Marine trailer. This looks sick. As someone who is spending more and more time in the Warhammer universe, I gotta say, this trailer got my juices flowing. The first game in the series is beloved and held up as one of the few truly great Warhammer games. I wouldn't know since I haven't played it, but I'll certainly be going back to do so before Space Marine 2 drops sometime in 2023. Getting to the tail end now, Meet Your Maker is the next thing from Behaviour Interactive, makers of Dead by Daylight. It's like 3D Mario Maker, kind of, the way you need to build deadly labyrinths for people to scale, doing them with as many traps and baddies as possible. This one was revealed a while ago and it got an official release date April 4th. There's a new Crash Bandicoot game on the way, sort of. It's a brawler, I think? Looks to be like a team-based battle thing. I don't know, I probably would have much rather a mainline Crash game, but apparently Activision weren't happy with how the last one sold, so here we are. This one is called Crash Team Rumble, and it drops sometime in 2023 as well. The next big surprise came in the form of Crime Boss Rock A City. This one stars an all-star cast, including Danny Trejo, Kim Basinger, Danny Glover, and my personal favorite, Michael Madsen. The gameplay they showed off in this trailer looks kind of like a bog-standard shooter, but man, this cast, holy shit. This is being developed by a Czech-based studio. I think it's their first game. Their website says that there's 70 people strong and it's being published by 505 Games. It hits really soon, 28th of March to be precise. I don't know, man, something about this one just doesn't make sense to me yet. And as excited as I am for it, I'm gonna try and keep a lid on that until I get a chance to play it for myself sometime in the future. Elden Ring would take home the best game direction award, the one time that Miyazaki would take the stage without incidents. And then it was on to the next chapter in the Cyberpunk 2077 universe, Phantom Liberty. How many times you gotta take a bullet for these motherfuckers in the name of empty promises? They were surprised enough to know that Keanu Reeves was reprising his role, but to know that Knuckles himself, Idris Elba, was joining the cast, my god, who are they gonna add next? Meryl Streep? Yes, please, that would unironically be very cool. We still don't have a date for Phantom Liberty, but odds are it's slated for sometime late next year. Two absolutely massive reveals to go. The first one was this bad boy. Roll it, Austin. <laughs> Now I have never played an Armored Core game and I know absolutely nothing about the Armored Core series, but I am now officially a massive Armored Core fan, just huge. And this is easily my most anticipated title of 2023, despite knowing absolutely nothing about it. Seriously though, I really have not played Armored Core 1 through 5, but I'm certainly gonna be doing some totally legal emulation since that appears to be the only practical way to get your hands on these games these days. The sixth game in the series, Fires of Rubicon, was officially revealed in this here trailer, but at that point, we still didn't know anything about it. Was it a Souls-like with mechs? Was it a reboot? Was it gonna follow in the footsteps of the previous games? We didn't know. Thankfully, IGN sat down with Miyazaki and Armored Core 6's game director, Masuru Yamamura, who was previously the lead designer on Sekiro. They confirmed that the title is not a Souls-like at all. It's a traditional mission-based mech game where you will outfit your mech in a variety of ways to dispatch both low-level foes and elaborate bosses who they say are the highlight of the game. It's single player focused but will have some multiplayer elements as well and the rumors are that this game is essentially finished and has been for a while so it shouldn't be too long until this one drops. Wouldn't be at all surprised if it was in the first half of 2023. No release date was provided though so that is of course just a guess. And finally, last big reveal of the show was one that I was especially excited for. Final Fantasy 16. Let's go. Come to me, Ifrit!
With Yoshi P producing and Sakurai on the pipes, Final Fantasy 16 is shaping up to be an absolute banger. Tonally, this looks so compelling. The art design and visuals look superb, and every single bar of music makes you want to load up Final Fantasy XIV and finish that Endwalker campaign just like I should have a long time ago. During the FPS podcast, we asked each other what our most anticipated game of 2023 was, and three out of four of us said Final Fantasy XVI, myself included. Just so pumped for this and extremely excited to see the official release date June 22nd, a week or so after E3. So rip my review schedule for that one. With all the big reveals out of the way, it was time to award the coveted Game of the Year trophy. And as much as we all loved God of War, and we did, there was really only one game that completely took over and became a cultural phenomenon this year, Vampire Survivors. But that game wasn't nominated, so I guess we'll have to settle for the next best thing, Elden Ring. Thank you so much. It was a traditional thank you speech by many metrics, but in the background, I saw this weird looking dude swaying back and forth. I thought to myself, that dude is not Japanese. That dude is not old. He does not belong on that stage and some shit's about to go down. Sure enough, it did. You know, real quick, I want to thank everybody and say that I think I want to nominate this award to uh, my reformed Orthodox rabbi Bill Clinton. Thank you, everybody. Turns out this dude, 15 years old, is a known prankster who's pulled stuff like this before to the point where he's actually been interviewed on Infowars twice. His weird utterances about Bill Clinton were just harmless ramblings, but his appearance on stage did raise serious security concerns as things could have been a lot worse had this dude harbored more dangerous intent. Luckily, the worst things to come out of his strange appearance was memes and mods. More on that later in the show. And that was the Game Awards 2022. I'll tell you right now, I think it was a great show, but I also think that it's not a exactly getting the balance right of awards to reveals. It feels like only maybe like six awards were actually handed out on stage. The rest were quickly canted through as we shuttled from trailer to trailer. I know I did the same thing here in this show, but this is a new show. It's not an award show. And I think next year it'd be great if Jeff could at least double the number of awards handed out on stage, giving game makers their well-deserved moment in the spotlight. I want to hear what these people have to say, and I'm sure I'm not alone in that. Encouragingly, I do think this was the best show that Jeff has put on to this point. Very little in the way of cringe ads or awkward celebrity appearances. Every year, Jeff is making progress, and I'm hopeful that that trend continues into 2023 and beyond. We already did a buttload of announcements, so we can skip that block this week and ask, what came out last week? Well, we're at the tail end of the year, so last week was a slow one. That Back for Blood DLC dropped, River of Blood, and it seems okay. Steam reviews have it at around 77% mostly positive, which is better than most paid DLCs are able to hit, so that's something. Hello Neighbor 2 hit a bunch of platforms last week, and this one has landed with a bit of a thud. Despite a higher than average price for an indie title, the game is apparently only a few hours long, and it ends with a splash screen promising future content. Content and features were also apparently cut from the base game ahead of release, like the AI, which had earlier promised to learn and adapt based on your playstyle and choices. The result is a bunch of very middling 5 out of 10 scores on Open Critic and a mixed 61% on Steam. Pretty clear that this one needed some more time in the oven. Knights of Honor 2 Sovereign is a grand strategy game from developer Black Sea Games. The grand strategy crowd can be hard to please, but this one seems to have largely done it, sitting at a mostly positive 73% on Steam and a strong 75% on Open Critic. Checkpoint Gaming scored this one an 8 out of 10, saying, quote, While this type of gameplay may not be everyone's cup of tea, it will certainly be challenging and energizing to those who don't shy away from some statistics and resource management, end quote. Choo Choo Charles. Man, this one has certainly divided fans and critics. So if you don't remember this one, it's the weird-ass, creepy, open-world game about a dude trying to build a train on the fly while a killer arachno train named Charles pursues him. Steam reviews couldn't be happier, putting the title at a very positive 92%, and that's with nearly 4,000 votes in, so that's far from soft. Critics, though, are on a very different track. Train joke. They have it at a week 57. IGN scored it a 4 out of 10, saying, quote, Choo Choo Charles is a haphazardly assembled meme come to life that's short, silly, and exceedingly dull, end quote. And Twinfinite were even more brutal with their 1.5 out of 5. Quote, if you're looking for a scary spider train experience that'll get your heart rate going, you're probably just better off watching that Spider-Man 2 scene where everyone keeps Peter Parker's secret. At least that way you'll have seen a good movie instead of playing a video game that was simply made because the idea sounded good in theory, end quote. 
I don't know, man. I'm still going to play this one, not going to lie. And finally, Wavetail dropped on a bunch of platforms last week after earlier having been a Stadia exclusive. Almost no Steam reviews for this one yet, but it only dropped a few hours ago at the time of writing. Open Critic has this at a strong 75 with reviews made up of both the OG Stadia release and new reviews from other platforms. Gaming Nexus reviewed it on Steam and scored it 8 out of 10, saying, quote, It's truly a blessing that Thunderful Games has brought Wavetail over to all modern platforms after Google put Stadia in the tomb. Wavetail tells a heartfelt narrative narrative filled with beautiful visuals and a soothing soundtrack in an open world experience that's short and sweet." End quote. It does look really lovely and like I said, after the death of Stadia, I hope that it and all the other Stadia refugee games find a healthy audience on new platforms. So what's coming out this week? You know what? There's actually some stuff this week. The bulk of it is ports and remasters. Case in point, Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion, which launches on all platforms today. This is a pretty comprehensive reworking of the PSP Classic, with a massive visual uplift and a reworking of the combat being the most notable changes. I hadn't actually played the original and was hoping to review this one. Sadly, Square sent me the code the day before the embargo, so I wasn't able to get that review out on time. Other outlets did get the code earlier, and they almost all had positive things to say about it. The game sits at a strong 80 on Open Critic. Nintendo Life reviewed this one on Switch and loved it, scoring it 8 out of 10 and saying, quote, Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion is everything that we hoped this remake would be. It takes a great game once shackled to handheld only hardware and brings it forth into a new generation with a fresh coat of paint, end quote. Giving the PC crowd some comfort, PC Gamer also enjoyed this one, scoring it at 86 and saying, quote, an excellent remake, prequel and game in its own right. Crisis Core has it all, end quote. I had plans to start this one on the plane ride over to LA, but I started playing Xenoblade Chronicles 3 instead, and 30 hours in, I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. Gris was one of my favorite games a few years back, but it was very much tailor-made to my tastes. It's a chill, dreamy, exploration-focused game with an elegant art style, a vibrant color palette, and an absolutely phenomenal soundtrack. I'm a sucker for those, but I'm not alone. Pretty much everyone loved this when it dropped back in 2018. And today, it's making its way to current-gen consoles. So if you haven't checked this one out yet, please do so. It's only a couple of hours long, but it's absolutely wonderful. You have to have a pretty high IQ to appreciate this next release. High on Life, arriving exclusively for Xbox consoles and PC today, day one on Game Pass. This one comes from Rick and Morty co-creator Justin Roiland. And it's a trippy-looking first-person shooter where your guns talk to you incessantly. This one apparently clocks in at around 10 hours and unless you're very okay with Justin Rowland yelling at you for 10 hours then you should give this one a miss. Personally, I'm probably okay with that, so I do plan to check it out at some point. Reviews for this one dropped yesterday, and they paint a predictable picture, given the fact that this Rick and Morty humor certainly isn't to everyone's taste. Open Critic has this at a fair 73. On the positive end of the spectrum sits God is a Geek, scoring an 8 out of 10 and saying, quote, High on Life is filled with some fun mechanics and great writing, and while it doesn't reinvent the genre, it makes it more enjoyable, end quote. On the other end of the spectrum lies Eurogamer, who didn't mince words when they scored it a avoid, and said, quote, Quote, a miserable cocktail of ideas from other action platformers and the worst parts of Rick and Morty, end quote. And I gotta say, as a Rick and Morty fan, I can attest that the worst parts of Rick and Morty are pretty fucking bad. So that is some dire criticism right there. Regardless, this one is on Game Pass, so if you'd like to safely sate your curiosity, then that's going to be the best way to do it. Neon White didn't snatch any awards at the Game Awards, but it will still feature in more than a few Game of the Year lists. It's getting a port to PS4 and PS5 today, so Sony ponies, have fun. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt Complete Edition. Man, we've been waiting a long time for this one, haven't we? Okay, so obviously this is the current gen console update for The Witcher 3, delivering 4K 60F performance and ray tracing. If you'd like to see the technical detail on this stuff, I'd recommend, as always, the Digital Foundry video on the subject. In terms of content, not only does this package include the base game and all DLC, but it also includes a bunch of community favorite mods that have been built into the game to improve visual fidelity and quality of life. All of this combines to create the definitive Witcher 3 experience, no matter the platform you're playing on, and no matter if it's your first time through or your 14th. Best of all, this is a totally free upgrade to existing owners of the game. Enjoy it. It'll be the last Witcher you get for a very long time unless you count the next season of the TV show starring Liam Hemsworth, but I don't think anyone's counting that. Black Tail is an interesting one. This is based on the legend of Baba Yaga and is a first person adventure game with a focus on archery combat, exploration and storytelling. It looks nice. Previews to this point have been positive. It's out on the 16th for current gen consoles and PC. And finally, Resident Evil 7 arrives on the Switch on the 16th. This is a cloud version, of course, meaning that it does require a good internet connection and is not available in all regions. Probably not the best way to experience this horror classic, but if the Switch is all you got, then you gotta dance with the one who brung you.
More than a few times this episode, I've mentioned my penchant for dreamy, artistic, exploration-focused flow state games. So put this on your radar. This is Europa, and despite its verdant landscapes, I can assure you that this is definitely set on one of Jupiter's moons, terraformed and now explorable by you, playing as an android trying to uncover the story of the last human being alive. Beautiful, expansive environments are the order of the day here, made all the more pleasant to explore by way of your ability to fly, or at least glide between whatever it is that will give you enough boost to remain airborne. Between the colorful landscapes, the flight mechanic, and the uplifting soundtrack, this looks like a great way to let off some steam, and I've always been down for experiences like this. It was just announced last week, and if you'd like to check it out for yourself or maybe even wishlist it, I'll leave a link to it on my Steam Curator page, which also has links to all of the other Put This On Your Radar stuff I've recently covered. I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now. The last of the year, I'm getting emotional. Dry those tears though, because where nobody got me, Epic got me with some free stuff. Right now you can grab Wildcat Machine Gun, a twin stick bullet hell shooter thing, as well as Saints Row 4 Re-Elected Edition, a package that includes all the game's add-ons and DLCs, and there's a whole bunch of them. That wraps up on the 16th, at which point a new mystery game will be available. Usually when Epic do a mystery game, the results are pretty strong, not always, but often enough. So I'd recommend marking your calendars and checking back on the 16th because I will not be here to remind you next week. Oh my God, I'm getting emotional again. Only other sort of free stuff to shout out this week is Game Pass, which didn't get a refresh, but a huge amount of stuff went live on the service. So I think we need to take a second just to acknowledge some of that. I mean, High on Life, for example, that's on there. Eastwood is a narrative-led RPG that everyone loved when it dropped a while ago. Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga was hands down one of the best family games released this year, and now that's on the service. And Chained Echoes is a game I'd never even heard of until reviews hit, and it turns out it's one of the best turn-based JRPG-style games to release this year. Nothing but adoration for that one, it seems. So if you're into that sort of stuff, then be sure to check it out as it's absolutely flying under everyone's radar at the moment. The biggest addition to Game Pass this week, though, is that every Riot game has joined the service. So what does that mean, given that all Riot games are free, you ask? Well, it means that every single champion, agent, card, or whatever is unlocked across League of Legends, Valorant, Legends of Runeterra, and Teamfight Tactics. It represents over $1,000 in value if you were to pay for all this stuff up front. And it's just a totally insane deal if you're just starting out with Riot games, since unlocking all of this stuff takes a while. So yeah, not bad. Finally, as a reminder, there are plenty of Game Award nominees on Game Pass. So if you happen to have missed any of them, then this is a great way to catch up. A Plague Tale Requiem was a standout Game of the Year nominee, and it's on there. Immortality was nominated for Best Performance, Narrative, and Game Direction. Metal Hillsinger was a frontrunner for Best Soundtrack. Tunic was nominated for Best Action and Best Indie. And let's not forget Actual Game of the Year, Robbed by Elden Ring. I'm talking, of course, about Vampire Survivors. It's only like five bucks to buy it and you can get it on mobile for free, but hey, it's a nice feather in Game Pass's cap, so why not? If you were paying attention earlier in the episode, then you already know what our feel-good story for the week is. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you Reformed Rabbi Bill Clinton. Not exactly the end of the year that many of us, Miyazaki-san included, were expecting, but hey, we don't choose the memories, the memories choose us. By yelling random gibberish into a microphone before being escorted off stage by Jeff Keighley's hired goons. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap on the final proper show for 2022. Next week, as I said, we'll be doing our year-end news wrap-up where we take a look back at the biggest games, news, people, and events that define the year. That is the third year running that we'll be doing that, and it's always a good time, so I hope you'll join me for it. If you'd like to, then be sure to hit the subscribe button and ding the notification bell so you'll know the minute that video is live. If you enjoyed this video, then as always, smacking that like button is a huge help to both the video and the channel, and I'd appreciate it muchly. I'm off to play some Dark Tide now, with a smattering of Xenoblade thrown in for good measure, and maybe even some Destiny 2, now that Dim is back up. You have yourselves a great week, and don't forget to do your Christmas shopping. Speaking of which, stick around for this week's sponsor, Manscaped. What do you get for the man who has everything? And when I say everything, I mean unruly body hair. Sure, you could give them a bottle of scotch or a copy of Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, but are those products going to assist them in their intimate male grooming? 
I'd argue that the latter is probably going to result in some steps backwards in the personal grooming stakes, but that's a topic for another video. So dig deep this year and fill the stockings of your Bromeos with the Manscaped Platinum Package 4.0, the one-stop shop to handle everything in your jocks. Inside the Platinum Package, you'll find their Lawn Mower 4.0 Trimmer, Weed Whacker Ear and Nose Hair Trimmer, Ultra Premium Body Wash, Ultra Premium 2-in-1 Shampoo and Conditioner, Ultra Premium Deodorant, Crop Preserver Anti-Chafing Ball Deodorant, Crop Reviver Ball Spray Toner, anti-chafing boxes, and the shed travel bag to hold all your goods while traveling. First off, the Lawn Mower 4.0. Manscaped say this is the greatest ball trimmer ever invented, and since they're pretty much the only entity who specializes in ball trimming, I'm inclined to believe them. These people, no balls. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The Lawn Mower 4.0 is waterproof and also has a 400K LED spotlight in case you need a more precise shave. Ever wanted to spotlight your junk? Well, now you can. Please use responsibly. In addition to shaving, you can now completely upgrade your shower routine with the Ultra Premium Body Wash and Ultra Premium 2-in-1 Shampoo and Conditioner. You'll have all your skin and hair feeling hydrated and smelling fresh. Don't forget to apply their aluminium-free Ultra Premium Deodorant for that cologne quality scent on the go. Ever find yourself getting a bit sweaty down there? Thankfully, their Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner can solve these problems for you. Once they touch your sack, you'll never go back. All of this and more in the Platinum Package 4.0. It covers all bases from head to toe, the best bang for your shebang. Get 20% off and free shipping with the offer code SKILLUP at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com and use offer code SKILLUP at checkout. Manscaped, get your jingle balls ready for the holidays. That was one of their lines actually, credit to them. Thanks Manscaped copywriters for doing my job for me. Thanks for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.